as the author of the second paper has not attended. So we are going on with the third paper, which is the history and provenance of cultural heritage collections, new approaches to modeling analysis and visualization. Uh, the author is Professor Toby Burrows from Australia, from the University of Perth. Yes. Okay. And now he is visiting scholar in uh, King's College. Which the floor is classes. yours. Buenas well, tardes. Um, I'm going to be speaking in English. I hope that's okay. Um, no hablo español. Uh, but the I've tried to make the slides um, interesting, visual, visual. I'm going to talk about a European Union project that I'm involved in, which is aiming to create digital visualizations of the histories of cultural heritage objects. And I'm looking specifically at medieval and early modern European manuscripts. I'm using a specific manuscript collection, that of the 19th century English collector Sir Thomas Phillips. So I will talk first about Sir Thomas Phillips and his collection, and then I will talk about data modeling and visualization. So the collection of Sir Thomas Phillips, as you can see, was a very large collection. Nobody actually knows how many manuscripts and documents were in it, but the estimate is something between 40,000 and 60,000. He spent a lifetime collecting them. And that is almost certainly the private, the biggest private collection ever of manuscripts. He also owned a lot of other materials as well, as you can see. At the Grolier Club in New York, they have a recreation of a small part of his collection. So you can see Imagine this multiplied by about 40,000 times. He filled two stately homes with this material. Hmm. He was buying in the early and middle of the 19th century, and that was good time to buy because a lot of other earlier collectors, individual collectors, were selling their collections. And these are some of the well-known collectors that, whose collections fed into Philip's own collection. He bought material from their collections. So he aggregated collections, other people's collections, into his own. He also drove up the prices of manuscripts too. It's very difficult to compare costs between the 19th century and today, but one estimate, and these are in pounds, so you'll have to convert to euros in your head, um, something like a quarter of a million pounds was what he spent in 19th century money, not in modern money. The equivalent today is probably over a hundred million pounds. And as you can see, he spent something like two thirds of his entire income every year for 50 years on manuscripts. So it was a very, very large collection and a very important one. But after Phillips died in 1872, it was gradually sold off and dispersed around the world. He tried to reach an agreement with the British Museum and then with the Bodleian Library to have the whole collection, but they, that failed. So the, over the next hundred years, the collection was sold off gradually in bits and pieces, as you can see, particularly through auctions at Sotheby's in London. And so now the Phillips collection, the former Phillips collection, is dispersed around the world. And that includes Perth, Australia, where I come from, where we have at least one Phillips manuscript. So 
So the, the project that I'm doing for the European Union really has two main questions. Looking at this big collection and its history and how it was transmitted over the centuries. So in manuscript terms, we call that provenance. It's the history of the manuscripts that were in that collection. The second question is really around managing the data, the metadata about that collection. And I'll talk more about that now. So to start, no, let me say this first. Within that big project, there are other specific, smaller questions that can be addressed. And as I have talked to other researchers, they have raised specific research questions that are of interest to them. And these are some examples. And they, so my project, I'm trying to address some of these smaller questions as well. So looking at particular types of manuscripts that pass through the Phillips collection, such as Irish manuscripts. Looking at the connection between Phillips and other collectors. So Guglielmo Libri was a notorious Italian collector of the 19th century. A lot of his manuscripts came to the Phillips collection. Chester Beatty was a famous American and Irish collector of the 20th century, and he bought quite a few Phillips manuscripts. There are at least 2,000 Phillips manuscripts now in North American collections, for example, and that's an interesting small project in itself. Okay, so the first thing I, in my project that I've had to do is try and bring together data about the Phillips collection from a range of different sources. And as you can see, there are a lot of potential sources, some of which are databases, existing databases. Some are in printed catalogues and books. Some are handwritten and haven't been digitized. And of course, they're all in different formats and they overlap. There is no one single source of data about the Phillips collection. They also contradict each other sometimes, which is a challenge, I have to say. So let me talk about just two of these. The Schoenberg database of manuscripts. That's produced by the University of Pennsylvania. It contains something like, I think nearly a quarter of a million records for sales of manuscripts. It's trying to track the history of manuscripts going from one owner to another. And in that database, there are something like 20,000 records relating to Phillips manuscripts. These are a few examples. They only cover 6,000 of the Phillips manuscripts. And if you remember, there were something like 40,000 of them at least. So it's not comprehensive, but it's in a good reusable form because you can export the data as Excel or CSV. So to start my project, I took all the records I could from this database in CSV format and reworked them. So they gave, it gave me a good starting point. At the other end of the scale are sources like this, which is one page of a list of Philip's manuscripts compiled shortly after his death. So as part of the process of probate for his will, for his children who inherited the manuscripts. There are actually two different versions of this list and they don't agree with each other. And to get that into digital form, into usable form for my purposes, is very time consuming. And as you can see, some 
manuscripts have been crossed out and relabeled. So Phillips couldn't even agree on which numbers apply, what the content was of that volume. So those are some from 26,000 onwards. So having looked at all the, the data and made some selections from it, my next problem was how to model, how best to devise a common data model to draw the different data together. And that is a typical statement that you will see in catalogues, um, particularly from libraries, about the provenance of a manuscript. So saying, at this date, this person bought this manuscript in this place from this um, body organization and that it had previously belonged to someone else. And as a very simple, the most simple modeling of that looks something like that. So you've got the entities in blue, people like Phillips and Sotheby's, the organization, the manuscript itself, um, Libri is the former owner, and then the buying and selling transactions involved and the place and time. And that is, there's a lot of disagreement. There is no standard way for representing this digitally. There are various attempts to do it. That's the most simple form of it. So I've, I've tried a few methods for turning that into a usable database. And I won't go into all those today. But what I'm using at the moment is this software called NodeGoat, which was, has been developed in the Netherlands. It's been used for several European projects um, in Amsterdam in particular. And as you can see, that is designed to allow you to model, you create your own model, and then it provides a layer of visualizations on the top. It's probably best explained by showing you some examples. So what I've, what I've done with the data modeling for this is I've tried to keep it very simple. I've got what NodeGoat calls objects. So those are simple, basic entity types, classes. And then NodeGoat has something called sub-objects. And I've used those mostly to model the kinds of transactions that are involved. So sold, donated, owned, described, produced, and so on. And then you can use that to link the different entities together through those sub-objects. So let me show you an example. That's my record for one of the Phillips manuscripts. And in the lower half, the bottom half of the screen, you have a series of sub-objects relating to that. So those are when it was produced, where we know it was owned by somebody at a particular date and where it when where and when it was sold of course this kind of data in the manuscript world is very um, uncertain and there are lots of gaps so these are these are just the points in the history of the manuscript that we know something about And what you can then do is visualize that using the NodeGoat interface. So it has simply taken my record for that manuscript and applied it, applied a geographic visualization to it. So just, to, just north of Florence, you can see where it's thought to have originated, the, the purple dot. And then it goes to Rome and then to London and then to Cheltenham in England, where Phillips lived, and then back to Rome, because it's now back in Rome. 
So that's a history of one manuscript, a partial history, not a complete history. A more complicated manuscript about which we know a lot more. So as you can see, there are a lot more transactions, sub-objects in this record, including the fact that it was owned in 1820 in Madrid, though it originally was produced in Paris in the mid-13th century and is now in Boston, in the Boston Public Library. And if you look at the visualization of that, you'll see that it originates near Paris, at some point goes to Madrid, then goes to England, particularly to London, where it's bought and sold a few times over, and then eventually crosses the Atlantic to Boston. So what I've got next is a group of 21 manuscripts that were formerly in the Phillips collection, but also belong, belonged at one point to the Irish collector Chester Beatty, who I mentioned earlier. So I've tried to track the histories of those as a group. So if you look at the, the aggregated graph of the movements of those 21 manuscripts, you can see that they, uh, they, the purple dots, they originate all over Western Europe, mostly France and Italy. And then they've, at various stages, moved around Europe. Most of the activity has been in London. And then they all start moving across the Atlantic, as you no doubt expect in the history of manuscript collecting the American libraries got involved and large numbers of these manuscripts started moving across the Atlantic. The other thing you may have noticed there is there is a time slider at the bottom of this visualization. So you can use that to look at particular stretches of time, which is an, an interesting alternative way of visualizing them. So if you look at the, the history of these 21 manuscripts, up to 1781, we actually know very little about them. We know where we, th we think we know where they came from. In some places we do know exactly. So all those purple dots are where they were produced. By 1781, a few of them have moved. That's the red dots. So we know they were owned somewhere else before 1781. If you then take them forward to 1927, by this stage they are all owned in London by Chester Beatty. So they've been through the Phillips collection and come out again and Chester Beatty at this stage was still living in London before he moved to Ireland. And again you'll see that one that we know was owned in Madrid at some point in the 17th century. But if you want to see what happened to them after Chester Beatty owned them, because a lot of his manuscripts were also sold, that's the picture there. So that just shows 1932, when Chester Beatty started selling his manuscripts through to the present day. And as you can see, some of them are still in Europe, but a lot have moved across the Atlantic to America, the US. Not, not a representative sample necessarily, but it gives you an idea of how the software works. So just to draw this to a conclusion, what I've done, that's just one group of 21 manuscripts that I've shown you. What I've done so far is about 1,400 manuscripts. So I have partial histories of those. And if you put all that together, oh, sorry, I should say, this is the, the other kind of visualization. Let me go back, maybe. No, oh, that's right. So you can also visualize them as a network graph. And again, this is showing them the size of the 
the nodes, the entities, is in direct relation to the number of times they appear in the, the sub-objects in the NodeGoat database. So London is the big white circle. Um, Chester Beatty is the big red circle. And Sotheby's is the big green circle. So it's simplistic, but it gives you a just a quick picture of what are the important um, entities involved in the histories. So that's just the 21 manuscripts. If you look at the 1400 that I've looked at so far, you'll see that, again, the picture is very similar. They all originate in Western Europe and move around Western Europe. And a lot of them have moved across to the United States. And again, you can start constructing much larger network graphs, which can be zoomed into, and you can look at particular nodes. The very large um, cluster in the top left reflects the fact that at least a couple of thousand of the manuscripts are now in the Bodleian Library. So there are, again, this is not a representative sample, but it's it shows what, what can be done visually with records for something like 1,400 manuscripts. So I said these visualizations are not explanations in themselves, and they're not um, they're not terribly sophisticated. But the advantage, from my point of view, is that they are part of the same software that I'm using to pull together the data about the manuscripts. So I could export that and use a different visualization interface if I want to. And I'm, if I get time, I will try doing that. But this is all happening within the same piece of software. So it's useful for a diagnostic purpose, at least from my point of view. So I might finish there. Gracias. And we have some minutes for questions. Thanks. It's fascinating how much love and dedication can go into manuscripts. Really nice to see. And I admire the work that you have done so far in, in building up this database. And of course, always we have to adapt existing technology for our purposes. So this sub-entity type fits well to your, your purposes. My question is how others can apply and reutilize the data that you are producing. So do you export this to some common format? Is it put in some repository so that others can have access? Are there common protocols? What are the standards? So what do you do in order to make this data usable for more than only the software tool and the methodology that you are applying? Yes, thank you. That's, that is a very good question, a very pertinent question. At the stage of my project, that is that is something that I am planning to do in the remainder of the project when I have enough data. At the moment, this is a private, not a public database. But I suppose what I can say is that I intend to make it make the raw data available, at the very least, as Excel or CSV files. I'm also working on mapping between my core entities and things like CDOC CRM, which I looked at but found too complex to implement on my own, really, uh, frankly, and, and other metadata schemas as well. So at least there will be some relation between what I've done and the the more general, generally applied metadata schemas. Uh, interestingly for me, I saw a presentation from the British Museum recently where they have reduced for 
display purposes, they have reduced CDOC CRM down to something like six core entities, which map quite well to what I've done. So it is possible to, to map what I've done to some of those bigger schemas. So yes, the data will certainly be made available in raw form. Whether the node go interface will be made available, I think depends on the the developers of the software because it's currently hosted on their site. But I I will certainly um, ask that it be made public. Yes. Interesting. I at first, as coming the question coming from someone who uh, also has an interest in collection mapping. Um, I'm wondering, uh, you know, one of the problems, or, or I'm sure one of the challenges you see with this is right is is the question of scale, right? Because there are certain metropolitan environments, right, that that tend to be aggr literally aggregators of documents, or, or right, and so these 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 things end up in collections, which makes the visualization a bit hard to read, right? Because those sites become dominant. And I'm wondering if there's a way, or if you've been thinking a little bit about how other aspects of the metadata might be included in the visualizations, or how, or maybe, uh, you know, uh, imagining this, and this is just speculative on, on my part, that maybe even the, the map surfaces could be warped in a way you know, to 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 not have such um, uh, large nodes, right, around those kinds of settings where they move. So I'm getting at is is, is are there ways of of massaging the data to or massage, sorry, not the data, massaging the visualizations so that you can see a little bit more um, what's actually happening with all of the places that they're going, those documents renting up. Yes, thank you, thank you. That's also a good question. The problem for me is that I'm using the NodeGoat software, which is, well, it is a product, but it's still being developed and refined, and they have developed it originally for a specific project and are now applying it more widely and um, in different contexts. So I think it can also visualize TEI files now and things like that. So one limitation is that I am dependent on the developers of the software and to what extent they are interested in addressing some of those questions. I think it's fair to say that I am pushing their visualization perhaps beyond its limit. I, have, I need to get feedback from them about that. Um, because to me this is only a small number of the manuscripts this is going to get a, a lot bigger potentially the other so that's one approach the other would be as I said to try exporting the data into other visualization environments and seeing to what extent I can address some of those issues that you raise which yes I, I am aware of or am beginning to become more aware of, yes. Yes, scale is, is very important in this. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? I've got a couple of questions. One is, have you thought about using ontologies to uh, develop or to put all the data you are, metadata you are including? I have, yes. Well, in as much as something like CDOC CRM is a, an ontology. I'm never entirely clear of the difference between data models and ontologies and so on. What, what I have tried to do, I think, is keep this as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but I have had, I have looked at and done a little bit of work on trying to map this to things mm -hmm. like CDOC CRM. The, the problem with provenance in this sense yeah. is that it is difficult to model. Mm -hmm. And while ontologies like CDOC CRM do try and address provenance, mm -hmm. the results are really quite complex. 
in my view. Yeah. So at the moment I'm really, in a sense, developing my own. But if, if the project was twice as long, it would need to look at things like vocabularies as well, yes. standardised vocabularies. Yes. Um, and trying to import those or at least um, align with those. Um, I've really tried to keep it as simple and flexible as possible. Mm -hmm. And I have looked at things like the PROV ontology. Yep. Um, but again, that it didn't really match, at least to me, what I was trying to do yeah. closely enough. There is overlap. There is it is relevant in some ways. Yes. But the the kind kinds of provenance that it's looking at are somewhat different from the kinds of provenance I'm looking at. Might be the same word, but the provenance of digital objects is a rather different thing from the <laughs> the history of cultural heritage objects yeah. over hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I have looked, but yeah. so far I have, have uh, ruled them out. And there is another, another question, because I, um, it's related to the, the, the topics the, these manuscripts describe. Is it related to social problems of, the, of that time, uh, legal problems, or what type of the manuscripts were they about? Well, they were about absolutely everything. So, Philip's his idea of collecting, as as far as he talked about it, and he didn't really much, was simply to save everything that he could. So, and there is a famous story about how one of his agents found royal documents being sold in a grocer's shop here in Madrid and being used to wrap vegetables. And they turned out to be things like uh, royal documents from the, the Spanish court that had been thrown away. <laughs> so he bought these up in huge quantities. So there are documents relating to the Armada that are now in the Maritime Museum in London yeah. that were found in that way and saved by him. But it covers absolutely everything. And what I haven't attempted to do is look at the subjects yeah. because it would be so large, yeah. so universal, really. And they were not even classified in the, I mean, the no. owners, yes. No, no, they, they were just in numerical order. Yes. <laughs> I mean, fortunately, he did number them, which gives them a unique identifier yes. of a kind. And uh, how much or how many are in private hands and how many are in public hands? Yes, I wish I knew. <laughs> the, the answer, the best answer I can give is there are still quite a lot in private hands. I see. Um, because of the, the scale, I mean, one of the things I would like to try and do as an outcome from the project is at least make the data available for the manuscripts where we know their current location and I know there's a lot of interest in that but there are a lot of man a lot of the manuscripts that are untraced I mean my guess is it's just a wild guess at least 20 percent or 30 percent and you can still buy documents on eBay and ABE books and at auctions that say this was a Phillips manuscript so there are there are still a, quite a lot in private hands, maybe up to thirty percent. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, thank you very much.